Welcome to Train Signal. You're watching a lesson on networking command line tools. And I will tell you that in this lesson, well, we're going to do just that. We are going to go through a list of command line tools and make sure that you understand what they do. And then I'll even go in and demonstrate some of them for you. So the first couple of commands that I want to go over with you are very similar in nature. Uh, not only are they named similarly, but the functionality is pretty much the same. These two commands are IP config and then IF config. Now both are used to view TCP IP configuration. The difference is IP config is for the Windows operating system, whereas IF config you will find in things like Unix, Linux, and Macintosh. We will take a look at the IP config utility in just a few minutes. Now this next utility, I will tell you, is one that is the most powerful yet most simplistic utility out there. And the name of this utility is ping. Okay, it's just simply the ping command. And this is something that mo many people have heard of because, well, you hear it used all the time. You'll hear people say, can you ping this? Can you ping that? And this is something that is simply used to check for connectivity between networking devices. So when somebody comes to me and says, I can't see the such and such server, or I can't get to this, or I can't get to that, the first thing I will ask is, can you ping it? And we'll see in a few minutes here when we go in and, and see the utility in action, exactly what that means when I say, can you ping something? Now the next command is the ARP command. And you may recall from another lesson where we talked about ARP being a protocol, right? It's the address resolution protocol. And that protocol has to do with the resolution between IP addresses and MAC addresses. Well, I mentioned that ARP was not only a protocol, but it's also a utility. And the ARP utility is something that is used to view and manage something called the ARP cache. And this is a memory location where we have recently resolved IP and MAC addresses. Now here's another couple of commands, just like we saw before with the IP config and the IF config. They're very similar in name and they are also similar in function. And they both, I would refer to them both really as trace routes, whereas one is trace RT and then the other one is spelled out trace route. Now the trace RT command is what we would use in Windows, whereas the full spelled out trace route command is what you would see in the other operating environments like Unix, Linux, and Macintosh. Now, what does this command do? Well, basically, it will lay out the full path that is being taken from point A to point Z. In other words, if I want to see exactly how I'm getting from my computer to some server that's maybe in another office through the enterprise, or maybe I want to see how I get from my individual computer to a web server out on the internet, I can use the traceroute command to do this. This is also a great way to troubleshoot if you're not getting to somewhere. Right? Maybe if I have a client who says, I can't see a certain server in our enterprise, well, as much as I told you the first words out of my mouth will be, can you ping it? If we're also not able to ping it, the next step from there would be to do a trace route and see where between that client and that server the breakdown comes into play. Now there's another couple of commands that are not similar in name, but they are similar in functionality. And they are nslookup, which is used in Windows, and dig, D-I-G, which is used in Unix, Linux, and Macintosh. Now, one thing that I will point out to you is that nslookup can also be used in those other operating environments, but dig is considered to be more powerful and therefore the preferred utility for those operating environments. Now, if we jump back to nslookup for a minute, which we would use in the Windows operating system, it is used to troubleshoot DNS name resolution issues. Okay, so anything that has to do with host names and DNS, things like that, 
if we're trying to troubleshoot that form of name resolution, we're going to use NSLOOKUP. Now, one key thing that I want you to know about the NSLOOKUP utility is that it has both an interactive and a non-interactive mode. What this means is you can go to your command line in a Windows environment and just type NSLOOKUP, and it will take you into the NSLOOKUP prompt. Okay, you won't be in a normal command prompt anymore. And then from there, you can type different commands that work within the utility. Or you could type out an entire command where you have NSLOOKUP and then various switches that follow the command to get a result just from that one command. And that's something that you would do if you were scripting your NSLOOKUP command. You would just want to put the entire command with the switches so you can just get your result. Whereas the interactive is more if you were sitting at the computer and you wanted to work your way through this troubleshooting process. That said, I will tell you that where I, I mentioned that NSLOOKUP can be used in other operating environments, the one drawback is that you do not have that interactive mode. You only have the non-interactive mode if you're working in Unix, Linux, or Macintosh. Now the next command that we'll talk about is something called netstat which does pretty much what it sounds like. It is used to display network statistics, okay, or more specifically TCP IP network statistics and connections. Okay, so if you are trying to troubleshoot a network problem, it can come in handy to see certain statistical information about what's going on with the network. And then we have another statistical-based utility it's also a utility that's not used so much in today's networks, and I'll explain why in just a moment here, but it's NBT stat, and this is used to display something called net BIOS statistics. And this has to do with statistics revolving around your net BIOS names, which is why you don't see it used too much anymore, is because net BIOS names are not used that much anymore. But if you are in an environment that uses NetBIOS names, NBC stat can help you in troubleshooting those NetBIOS name resolution issues. And before we jump over to a demonstration of some of these tools, there's one last command, and I will tell you, I'm not really going to go into much detail, nor am I going to demo this command, uh, because we do so in another lesson on routing, but it is the route command. And this is a command that is used to manage the routing table from a command prompt. Okay, so now that we have gone over all of the various network command line tools, I would like to show you how a few of them work. So let's go take a look. All right, so here we are looking at my desktop. And the first thing I need to do if I want to show you command line utilities is, well, we need to know how to get to the command line. Now, this is Windows 7 that we're looking at here. And in this operating system, you click on the Start menu. And there's a number of different ways you can get to the command line. And by the way, it's actually called the Command Prompt, which you'll see that right here. It's here because I've accessed it recently and or often. So Windows 7 uh, will put up the things that you've looked at recently right there on your Start menu. You can also find it through all programs and accessories. And there's your command prompt. Or what I like to do is just right down here in the search box, just type in CMD. And then there it is. That's your command prompt. From here, the first command I'd like to show you is ipconfig. So let's type in ipconfig and hit enter. And you get some basic IP configuration information. You'll see that I have my IP address my subnet mask, and my default gateway. Yes, there is some other information. Uh, first of all, I'll point out that there is an IPv6 address. I'm going to skip over pretty much everything IPv6 in this demonstration because it, it's not that IPv6 doesn't matter, it does. But just to get through showing you the utility and to stay simple and consistent with it, I'm just going to show you the IPv4 stuff. I'm also just not going to always talk about every single item uh, because you'll see in just a moment here, there's a lot of extra information that comes with some of these utilities. And I could literally spend hours going through every nook and cranny of these utilities. And some of this you're going to have to find out on your own 
but I'm going to hit the high level stuff that you should be looking for all the time. And to give you an example of how you can go through and learn this stuff on your own, one of the really cool things about command line tools is that you can type in the utility. So I'll type in IP config. And then you can go ahead and put in forward slash question mark. And this is not just for IP config. This is for pretty much every command line utility there is. And when you do that, you get help. And there's a lot of help. Matter of fact, I have to scroll back up here to see everything. Okay, so you'll notice here that here are all the different options that I can do with IP config. Some of the common ones are slash all for displaying full configuration information. If you've ever heard anyone say, hey, can you do a release and renew? They're talking about doing an IP config slash release and slash renew. And that has to do with releasing your IP information from the DHCP server and then renewing it. There are also some DNS related commands and these do come in very handy when troubleshooting DNS. And they have to do with flushing the DNS cache, which is a locally cached copy of recent name resolutions, registering with the DNS server and displaying the cache. So again, as I mentioned, I can't go through every single tiny little detail, but the good news is you can on your own. It's all laid out for you in great detail. Okay, you get the full syntax of everything. They give you the options and they give you some examples of how these things can be used. Now, one that I am going to show you right now is I'm going to do an IP config slash all. And you'll notice I get a lot more information. Now I'm going to scroll up until we can see the IP config slash all. There we go. I get a lot more information listed here. Now, to be specific, let's look at some of these. Here's our physical MAC address. I can see whether I'm a DHCP client or not. If I scroll down, I still have my standard IPv4 address as well as my subnet mask and my default gateway. I see information about my DHCP lease since I am a DHCP client. I see who my DHCP server is. And then down here, this is probably the next most important information, my DNS servers. The reason this is a very important piece of information is because if you're ever troubleshooting name resolution, well, you're going to need to know who your DNS servers are that you're getting that name resolution from. Now, I'm not going to go into detail on that. We have a whole lesson on DNS servers. I just want to point out that this is where you can see what you're connected to. So that's basically the IP config command. Now the next command I'm going to type in is CLS. Now that's not part of this lesson, but I, I just want to point out that CLS, let me hit enter, boom, great way to clear the screen. Get all the clutter off the screen so you can start without you know, being distracted by everything else. So moving on to the next network command line tool, that would be the ARP command. I want to show you ARP. And the first thing I want to do with any command is put in a slash question mark so that I can see all the various information about the different options and the syntax and all of that. The very first one here, you'll notice ARP A. It's to display the ARP cache. Okay, display your ARP entries. So let's actually do that. I'm going to type in ARP A. And there you go. You have a bunch of entries. And by the way, I never know what this is going to show me. And the reason why is because it is dynamic. In other words, it has to do with what IP addresses have I communicated with recently that I still have stored in this cache. So let me give you an example. Let me go ahead and I'm going to open up Internet Explorer. And let's do something like Let's just go to Google. Now, why am I doing this? Well, I'm doing this just because, let me close this. I just wanted to make connectivity outside of my network. And what I want to show you here, if I come back and do the ARP A command again, no, I don't get an entry for Google or for Google's IP address. And that's because I'm on an internal network. What I did get was the IP address of my router because that's what my computer communicates with via MAC address. Only things on my network. Okay, so apparently I had not 
communicating with my router in a while, and so it wasn't on the list, whereas now it is. And you'll notice it's dynamic. Now, another thing that I can do here is if I were to type in ARP D, that's for delete, and I can put in, you know what, let's use the same one, the IP address of the router, 192.168.10.1. Watch what happens here. I actually get an error. And this is something very important to pay attention to because once you get to Vista and Windows 7 and Windows 8 and other server-based operating systems as well, certain commands are protected because they don't want you to cause damage or at least they don't want an average person to cause damage and they required elevated privileges. So in order to be able to use these elevated privileges, I'm going to close the command prompt and this time when I go to open it, I'm going to right click on it and select run as administrator. Now I am an administrator so it's just going to say are you sure and I'll say yes. If I was not an administrator on this computer it would prompt me for credentials. At this point I'm going to go ahead and put ARP A just to show that the table is still the same. And now I'm going to put in ARP D 192.168.10.1 hit enter and look at that it looks like nothing happened. Right? You don't get a confirmation, you don't get an error, but something did happen. Because if I put in ARP-A again, you'll notice that 10.1 is gone. Now, you may remember that when I typed in this command the first time, 10.1 was not there. These dynamic entries will disappear if I don't have communication with them. The point behind using the dash D command and manually deleting an entry is if you saw something that was just wrong and you didn't want to wait a certain amount of time to let it disappear on its own. Now I'm not going to go into any more detail here on the ARP command because I will tell you that this is somewhat, you know, kind of a thing of the past. I mean the command is still valid, the tool still has the same purpose, it's just the way things have moved into such uh, an overall dynamic environment, it's very rare that you'd have to come in here and manually manage the ARP cache. Now the next command I'm going to show you and then I'm going to actually come back to ARP for just a quick moment. And the next command I want to show you is the ping command. So I'm going to just type in ping and then an IP address. And guess which one I'm going to do? The router. Okay, I'm going to put in 192.168.10.1. I'll hit enter and you'll see I get these replies. Remember, I said this is the like most simplistic yet most important tool and most powerful tool there is. Okay, because this is showing connectivity. This is proving with these replies that I have connectivity with my router. When it comes to troubleshooting connectivity, it's all about doing the ping command. It's all about saying, do I have that ability to connect with that particular device? Now I just want to show you before we go any further into ping that if I do ARP slash A, guess what's going to show up again? That's right, you guessed it, 10.1. I just wanted to show you that having something put into that ARP table really has to do with any form of communication. I showed you by opening up an internet browser and going out to an internet website, which means I have to go to my router, and then I also showed you through a simple ping command. All right, so back to the ping command. If I do ping slash question mark, you will see that there's a number of different options here and they have a lot to do with forcing specific connectivity type scenarios. One of the switches that I've used many times is the dash T command right up at the top and you'll see that this says it'll keep pinging until stop. Okay, because remember when I did ping 192.168.10.1, how many replies did I get? I got four of them. And then it's done. If I were to put in the same command, ping, but this time put dash T and put in the IP address, you'll see here that this is going to be a constant stream of replies. It's never going to stop until I tell it to. It'll either stop if I close the window, okay, I could either close my command prompt and that would make it stop, or I could hit control C, which is a way of breaking into the current command. Now why have I used this and why does this come in handy? Well very often 
if I cannot connect with something. Rather than try to do something to fix it, then try to ping and it fails, then I try to do something else and then try to ping and it fails and then do something else and ping and it fails. What I find is it comes in handy sometimes to just say ping dash T and by the way, let me go ahead and ping a bogus IP address. I'm just going to put in 192.168.10.2. I don't believe exists on my network. There we go. And it just, nothing happens. Now in this case, I'm getting destination host unreachable. Uh, the other option that you sometimes get, depending on what it is exactly that you're looking for, is you'll get a timeout. But either way, if I go ahead and did that with a dash T, it would just keep giving me the error again and again and again until I have fixed the problem. So sometimes it's a great way to sit somebody down in front of a computer and say, give me a holler when it's fixed. Or even you yourself may be looking at the computer and rather than having to just keep going back and typing the ping command, you'll know once it's fixed. Now again, there are many more things you can do with ping. You can change the size and the delay and things like that. But really, when it comes down to it, using ping in its just simplistic fashion, sometimes it's better than anything else. Now, one other thing I will point out that ping can help you with is it can help you to see if you have a name resolution problem. Okay, so if I were to go ahead and ping google.com, look what happens. The very first thing it does is it resolves the IP address. It shows me the IP address for Google. If I were to have a problem where somebody says, I can't get out to a certain website, what you could do is you could ping the name. And it doesn't have to be websites. It could be an internal server. It could be anything. If you ping the name and it gives you an error saying, can't find that name, then you know you have a name resolution issue. If you see an IP address, but then you don't get these replies, then you know that it's not a name resolution issue. You know that it's an actual connectivity issue. Okay, so that is the difference. So again, ping really has the capability of being a very powerful utility, even though again, it's just as simplistic as they come. Ping, name or IP address, do I have connectivity, yes or no? Let me go ahead and clear the screen. And let's take a look at Traceroute. So I'm gonna put in Trace, and because this is Microsoft, it's just Trace RT for Traceroute. And what I'm gonna do with the Traceroute command is I'm going to put in the name or IP address of somewhere that I want to look at the entire path. So the example that I'll use here is we were just using Google, so let's do it again. I'm gonna put in google.com, and when I hit enter, you'll notice that there are a series of entries that I'm gonna get here. It starts off, once again, with some name resolution. Okay, it resolves that IP address. But then instead of just getting replies, I'm gonna see a series of entries here, and there's quite a few. As I'm talking through this, you'll see them up here. There's a series of entries that will be made, and what this is showing me is this is showing me exactly how we're getting from this computer that I'm at right now out to one of the Google web servers. So you'll notice the first hop was 10.1. That's my router, right? My computer said it's outside my network, I have to go to my router. Then from there, I can tell you that 1.253 and 1.254 are a couple more routers out in train signals network. Okay, so once we leave my office in the train signal network, we have a couple more routers that we can go through. So it goes to 253. And, and I will tell you, this 1.253 address is actually a switch, not a router. And that switch has then been configured to pass it along if it's meant for the internet out to a router that's at 1.254. Then from there, all the rest of this that you see is all internet stuff. And that's stuff that I don't really know anything about. And when I say don't, I don't know about, I don't mean, I don't know the technology. I do know the technology. What I don't know is what are, you know, I have no control over these routers. These are just internet routers. Okay, so it's hopping through all these internet routers until eventually, look where it ends up. It ends up at Google's web server. This is a great way to troubleshoot. If you ping something and you don't get a reply, this is a great way to figure out where's the breakdown. Meaning if you look at the obvious stuff and you say, well, everything looks good on the computer and it looks like the router that this computer is looking to is okay. And maybe the server that I'm trying to get to, yeah, that server looks okay. And you're trying to figure out, well, I'm a little confused. 
Everything looks okay at the client. Everything looks good, okay at the server. There's got to be a breakdown in between. Traceroute can help you with that. Now, I will also tell you that even though for demonstration purposes, I took us to Google, the reality is that you would not typically use this utility for an external internet website because again, what am I going to do if I see a breakdown in any of these areas? Nothing. I have no control over it. This is something you would use in your own enterprise environment. So let me go ahead and clear this out. And then the next command I want to show you is netstat. I'm going to do slash question mark here just because I want to show you that this is a utility where we can look at, well, network statistics. Okay, so when it comes to troubleshooting, you look at a bunch of statistics about things going on in the network. So you'll see there's a lot of different options available. Although this top one here, dash A, which talks about displaying all the connections and listening ports. So let's go ahead and do that. Netstat dash A. Okay, you can see, and by the way, this right here where it says video dash PC, that is a proper name, meaning that is the name of this computer. So anywhere you see that, that's what you're looking at. Okay, and this just shows a bunch of ports that it's listening on. Okay, so that's one thing good to know you want, if you want to know that the computer is listening on various ports. And I will tell you, at this point, it's going to be really difficult to go into great detail on all of this information because unless you've already learned about the specific ports and protocols and things like that, a lot of this is going to just look like foreign information. One of the key things we can notice here is that under Proto, it shows either TCP or UDP. Okay, that's from the TCP IP protocol lesson. Where we learned about the transport layer protocols, TCP and UDP. I can also do a netstat dash O, and you'll notice that it's showing me active connections and it's blank because I'm not currently connected to anybody. So if I were to do something simple like open up a web browser, and go to Google, go ahead and come back to my command prompt and do the same command again, net stat dash O. Ah, look at that. Now I have a couple of entries. And if I were to open up another tab over here on my browser, and let's say I go to train signal, come back here to my command prompt, do the same command again. Ooh, look at that. I have a lot more entries and really you know when it determines how many entries it depends on what exactly the website's doing and how much activity there is how much information there is where else things are linked out to okay so you know there's not a whole lot again that I can go into in much more detail here without you know including other lessons in with it but I will tell you that overall netstat is a great way of just seeing what's going on with the network and taking a look at the connections that this computer is either making or is available to make. So let me go ahead and close the browser in the background here. I'll just close all my tabs. Let me clear the screen. And one last utility that I'd like to talk to you about is the NS lookup command. And remember, there's both an interactive and a non-interactive mode. So let's start off with non-interactive, where I just type NS lookup and then I'm going to add some information to it. So I'll say Google since we've been picking on them the entire demonstration here, .com. And I'll hit enter. And you'll see here that first of all, there's nothing within my own local network here. My own DNS servers are not authoritative for google.com. Okay, meaning the information for where the google.com servers are has, you know, that stuff's not listed in my own local DNS server. And that's why here it says server unknown. It's pointing to my DNS server, like that's where it's going to at least go to, but it's non-authoritative. So the non-authoritative information is that you'll see that Google.com resolves to a number of IP addresses, right? And we know that because Google is a large enough site that there's not just one server out there. There's many servers out there. As a matter of fact, there's more than just what I even see listed here. These just happen to be some of them that are probably in my local proximity so they're being sent back to my local DNS server when it checks in with others. Now, if I want to do this from an interactive perspective, I just type NS lookup all by itself and hit enter. And you'll notice that instead of getting back to a regular command prompt, I have a slightly different command prompt here, and that is the NS lookup prompt. If 
from here, I could go ahead and type help. And I get information about all kinds of different things that I can do within NS Lookup. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because, again, I want you to understand what the command is. You know, you can do an entire lesson. Matter of fact, I could do an entire course on everything that you can do with NS Lookup. Now, what I do want to show you is that from this interactive prompt, if I once again just type google.com, I get the same information. But now I'm doing it from within the NS Lookup prompt. Now, that's not necessarily significant as far as whether I did this interactively or not. I mostly just want to demonstrate the fact that you can do it from either direction. Typically, if you are sitting at the computer and you are trying to troubleshoot something, you are going to go into the interactive prompt and work your way through NS Lookup, looking up all sorts of different DNS-based activity. Whereas if you were trying to script using the NS Lookup command, you would go ahead and do it non-interactively so you could just enter it as a command. Now, to get out of this prompt, I just simply type exit. And that brings me back to my regular command prompt. And speaking of the command exit, if I go ahead and type exit from here, that's going to exit me out of the command prompt window altogether because that is pretty much it for this demonstration. Now, I do want to emphasize one additional thing, and that is that even though you only saw it happen with the ARP command when I went to delete an entry, Remember, I was in an administrative command prompt the rest of the way through this demonstration. There are many different commands that are going to require elevated privileges. I don't have them memorized. Matter of fact, I get burnt by it all the time. Okay? I, I personally will be in a regular command prompt, and I will go to do some command, some networking command line tool, and I'll get that error, and then I have to go back in with elevated privileges. For that reason, what some people choose to do is if you know you're an administrator and you know what you're doing, you just by default always open the command prompt with elevated privileges and then you don't have that problem. Okay, but other than that, those are some of the more commonly used commands. And again, even though I didn't go through every detail, you have the ability to put in a slash question mark or help and learn anything and everything that you need to know about the command. Okay, so that's pretty much it. I mean, we've gone through a series of commonly used and, quite frankly, handy networking command line tools to find what most of them were and how they work. I showed you a few of them. And I want you to practice and play with all of them. I, mean, I want you to experiment in different networks and see what these tools really can do for you because they can come in quite handy when troubleshooting different network problems. So while you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and take a break. And I will see you in the next lesson.